This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Yes, we're back. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And this is, uh, what is it? Uh, Think Tech Asia is what it is, yeah? And we're studying Asia as we must because we're in the middle of the Pacific and we are affected by, we are a part of all these events that take place in defining the Pacific uh, region. You know, there's a book, my name is uh, Pacific by Simon Winchester. He used to teach at the East West Center. It's a very interesting book. It's anecdotal in the sense that he has about a dozen stories of things that have happened in the Pacific uh, going back when, uh, from the war, you know, on forward. Um, and he tries to tell you, define what the Pacific is. Um, of course, the book is written about mm, well, three years ago. Um, he understood about the South, South China Sea, by the way. He understood. Anyway, if you were to write that book today, today, you would have another anecdotal story in there. It would be about technology. It would be about China's technology revolution and how it affects the Pacific, how it affects us, how it affects the U.S., how it affects the world. And Russell Liu, my inimitable co-host here on Think Tech Asia, is here to talk to us about that, about the technological revolution in China and how it affects us and the U.S. in general and the world and how we better watch what's going on in China. Welcome to the show, Russell. And I'm glad to be back, Jay, back from China. Um, and today's show is going to be fascinating because we're going to talk about something that is very special. There's a revolution going on in China. It's a good one. And that revolution is going to change not only China, but the world. And how does it apply to Hawaii? Where can we position ourselves? These are really lessons that are very timely today. So what's happened in China? I mean, there's something remarkable happened. First, we see China stand up, uh, Deng Xiaoping, right? He said, let's be a player on the world economic stage. And presto, China was. China was manufacturing everything for everybody in every continent. Um, but then things changed. Now, as of a couple of years ago, I guess it was Xi Jinping um, or maybe uh, his predecessor, uh, his predecessor. Hu Jintao. Hu Jintao decided, I think Hu Jintao, decided we're going to have a consumer economy, just like the United States. We're going to, we're going to uh, find technology to make the consumer market. We're going to consume our own goods instead of relying on selling them to other places. And by George, they have done that. Part of that change is the technology. And you and I, especially you, have seen China do some very innovative things, so rational, so mindful, of it, so useful using the technology. It's happening right now. So can you describe what life is like in the consumer technology in China? Well, we, we have this word we call a digital age. What is the digital age? Yeah. And you're starting to, if you go to Google the, the internet today, you'll find headlines all of about China as being the leader in the digital age. What does the digital age mean? Well, you know, when you think about it, um, digital age means technology that is changing the lives of everyday citizens transforming the society. You know, 30 years ago, if you go to a store in China, you'll see the shopkeeper with an abacus. Today, that abacus is no more. You're seeing people with smartphones. It's, it's a society that's ramped up through technology, making digital payments. You're seeing the convenience. Nobody carries cash today. Nobody carries credit cards. MasterCard, Visa, who cares? Um, you don't carry plastic cards. So when I'm out at Biki, I'm looking at the bikes, they said, slip your credit card in. They've leapfrogged above, beyond credit cards. OFO. OFO. OFO bicycles, right? They use uh, they scan QR codes. They're digital. That goes into e-commerce um, uh, applications through WeChat, WeChat Pay, Alipay, Bingo. The bank sends the money to a vendor. It's gone. The deal is done. Cash flows and moves quickly. The society moves. And so all of this is happening because China has made a big move to change its old economy in the 70s and 80s. We're looking at China as being the garage mat for manufacturing society. Slippers, sandals, <laughs> umbrellas are made in China. China made a conscious decision. We're going to move up the value chain. We're going to do something where we know that we have to do something that's going to accelerate our economy. What it's done is it's focused on innovation, technology. 
And so people were laughing. And Wes was laughing a couple of years ago. Say, ha ha, you know, we don't think they can do it. But today they it's a different. They did and it. They did it using technology. And they're still doing it. And it lubricates the daily transactions of our lives, make them faster, easier, and, you know, more of them. And so the result is they have achieved this, this new paradigm, this new consumer economy, focusing on technology like that uh, QR code thing. Yes. Uh, and the beautiful thing about Jay is that, remember, everyone in China, you can be in Xinjiang, China, Gansu, China, Beijing, Shanghai, Guilin, Chengdu, and you have the same application. You can get services. You can get goods. Uh, How about the country? And the, How about the country? The country is stabilized. You know, people are happy. In the country, way back, you know, way out, way out toward the Dobi, Gobi Desert. I mean, they still have this technology. They still have there? the technology ah. because it's the internet. They've got the internet. And the last 10 years, 20 years, China has made a conscious move, invested in the logistics, invested in high speed rail all across the country. So it is amazing what it's done. It's allowed small businesses to grow the backbone of any economy, it's allowed big businesses to grow, and it's allowed people to convenience. But you know, digital age. So what are we talking about? Let's take a look at a quick video yeah. of what's it like an everyday person. This is going to the fruit stand in Beijing to get a glass of watermelon juice. Let's watermelon see. juice. Watermelon okay, juice. it's the Let's famous watermelon video. juice video. Here we go. Okay, we're back here. We're at a point of purchase, and this is what it's looked like. It's fresh watermelon juice, all ready to go. So we are going to now show you how we will pay, and I will simply get my. WeChat. Okay, WeChat. Is it the plus button on the on the, on the top? And all you do is click scan the code. And then you scan the code. Uh, you just scan the code. And then you can enter the amount of money you need to pay. And how much would it cost you? So it is 56 quad for all these wonderful drinks. I press this. And and the green button looks like pay. It's processing. And now it says pay now. I hit pay now. I touch my thumbprint or my ID. It verifies it. Yep. Off to That's bed. it. And it's paid. That's all it's done. No cash. Money simply transfers to the bank from my account automatically. So now we can all enjoy the watermelon juice. Thank you very much. Another episode from FinTech Global, live in Beijing. Russell Leo and my guest here is Irene Lee. Russell, the, the watermelon juice looked pretty good. Actually. I know. I was just about to comment. We could use a glass of watermelon juice right now. <laughs> That's very refreshing. So, I mean, this is remarkably easy, and, and you got to think about it. Think about each step, each frame of that 90-second video. What you get is a system that is much easier than a credit card. It's a lot easier, and it's a cashless society. And the good thing about it is that two things that are important from a microeconomic point of view, development of small businesses who can now get consumers coming in. They don't have to worry about counterfeit money. Um, people have more of an urge to spend, consumer spending, convenience of it, and also the, the money that's transferred that are going to be tied into the banks instantly. No question about collectibles. And, and the government can figure out the taxes. And so it's right. a society that works for everyone. Right. And the growth of small businesses, and it's sort of like they call it China, the China dream. And um, it's, it's amazing when I come back to the U.S., you know, I've got to fumble for my cash. Oh, I don't have enough cash, but a credit card. It's an old system. So my question is, we need to take a critical look because these are the platforms that are changing the world. And it's because the Chinese are going outbound and are spending a big lot of money. And a majority of the global financial technology is being developed in China. One out of every three startup, technology startup, that's over a billion dollars, is starts in China. And that's big money. Well, I don't think we've been watching carefully enough. I mean, I don't think this administration fully understands the power of innovation. Um, and we, we've been going backward lately. This is, is that makes it even greater stark relief to compare what's happening in China and what's happening here now. We're losing ground, and they're gaining ground at a very rapid rate. Well, that's why it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, par it's a paradoxical, because in the U.S., we're talking about making America great. We're talking about bringing 
hard manufacturing jobs to our communities in America. But let's face it, you know, things are changing. The, the money is being made in financial services and technology. And factories in China are all automating. And robots well, They're are being outsourced robotics. to other places in Asia. That's right. And so, again, we are, are we slipping back today? Where are we in the curve? And it makes me question because the institutions upon which the banks rely on here, um, you know, they have their way of doing things, but we're not buying into technology. It means that we're going to be behind because around us, the Chinese are spending a lot of money. Yeah. And they're going around the world. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, you know, the local banks in Hawaii, they do not have great internet technology, online banking and all that. And uh, they're, they're a cut well below the average uh, city bank, I mean, big city bank on the mainland. But those banks are a cut below what's going on in China. And, and we're just not into innovation. And, and, and in this administration, we're going backward as fast as we can. Instead of getting away from coal, which is China, was China's uh, target, we're going to coal. What? What? It's backward. And so many other things like climate change. But, you know, I, I want to talk about, you know, this whole new paradigm of the cashless society and the QR code. First of all, let's understand, you know, uh, the, the mechanics of it. So I am flashing my camera, my cell phone camera, on a QR code. Okay, my camera reads the QR code. How does the shopkeeper, the guy with the watermelon juice, know that he has been paid? It'll show my application, it'll say, transfer made, success. On your phone? On my phone. And he will also see it on his digital side, the technology. Oh, he'll see the same yeah, thing. Yeah, some of the registers are tied in that way. And some of the bigger stores uh, also, they have their own scanners. And I have my own Q code. And for example, WeChat Pay, I have my special QR code. Alipay, I have a special Q card uh, code. And they will scan mine. And that Q code that I have is tied into my bank. So that money is automatically transferred. And it's amazing because I'll, I'll tell you a little story. The other night, I was asking a friend who's coming from Beijing to... Uh, they're going to visit here, and I asked me, um, can you get a pair of yoga socks for my wife? It's cheaper in China. And so she said, okay. She went on uh, the Chinese internet, e-commerce, and I, I sent her the link that I, uh, where I purchased it earlier. She ordered it, and she sent me a WeChat message saying it cost uh, 64 renminbi. And I said, great. And I, so I take out, I mean, here in the U.S., in Hawaii, I take out my WeChat. I, I find her WeChat pay account. And all I do is I say, hey, I'm going to transfer. There's a little button that says transfer. You're in the U.S. In the U.S. And you're paying and for I transfer a And I type in 64 and run me. And I hit enter. You've just paid. I've just paid. And it's chosen her in. And guess what? She sends a message three seconds later that Thank says, you. receive. Thank you. Ha! Huh. And see, this is why I'm saying it's not China. It's global effects. It's going across. Chinese are traveling across. Uh, they're coming to school they here. They made a system that will things. go global, that will and, go across boundaries. And that's, that's where it is, the beauty of it. It's a global thing. And so where are we in this whole well, scheme of things, you know? So, but now let me go back to the mechanics for a minute. So that the class of the class of, um, of watermelon juice costs what? Two kwai, three kwai, four kwai? Oh, we would fresh watermelon. I had about four or five cups for the crew there. <laughs> okay. So, so it was 60-something so, kwai. It was, okay, 60-something kwai. So what did that come to? Uh, well, maybe about $2, two bucks, two yeah. bucks for Okay. Yeah. So suppose I wanted to buy mm, something for 500 bucks uh, or 1,000 or 5,000. Can I use the same system? You can use the same system. Is it safe? It's safe. I, I, you know, I, I've actually um, I did some research on it, um, and it, it's, it's so far there are some problems, but overall um, it's been pretty safe. And they work it through the um, e-commerce vendors, Alibaba, Alipay. Oh, way, so, way so when you want to buy things like... Alibaba is like Amazon, yeah? Mm -hmm. You can buy all kinds of things using this very same QR you can system. Buy this, yes. And so what that does is it allows all these vendors, you don't have to have brick and mortars. You don't have to have Alamo Shopping Center. You could be in the far reach Mongolia, inner Mongolia and China and order yeah. something yeah. and you'll get in two days. And a little story at the university where I teach law, yeah. the basement of the uh, university, uh, small shops, there's a guy who has a little bakery and his baker is from Mongolia and she makes Black Forest cake. She makes New York cheesecake. And you would think, well, <laughs> where in the world is this guy going to get people who are going to come in here and order this stuff and have a cup of cappuccino? Yeah. What he does is at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, all the orders come in through Ali P. 
pay for WageShack, yeah. people have ordered it. So they're baking it. And it's the cheapest overhead. A small little bakery with a little shop. They bake it. Next morning, it's lined up the boxes. And the delivery people come pick it up, and they send it all across Bay So Bank. what you're saying is that the amount of capital you need to start a business like that is minuscule compared to what it would be, say, in this country. Yes. Um, you can put it together in no time at all. And it reminds me of something, I think it was on 60 Minutes. We've talked about this before, about a woman who was retired. She decided she liked cooking. She decided she was going to be a, a caterer person. And so she would take email from her customers. She would cook in her own kitchen at home. She would trundle off on the street with a little wheelbarrow affair. She would, she would visit their homes. They would do the, uh, the QR code transaction. Um, and she had a, a job with virtually no investment at all. Now she had a nice job business, if you will, only because she was using her telephone for these transactions. It was quite remarkable. So it's really remarkable because, you know, no matter what you say, the world has changed the Internet locally, Bank of Hawaii. I noticed the ward branch is closed. I noticed a lot of locations have downsized because, and I've, I've heard about some ad talking about the bankers are studying uh, e-commerce. And that's the world, the digital world. But the question is, where are we? Well, are we our masters of our fate? And I, I really think we need to take a hard look at it. Okay, and when this break is over, when we come back from this break, Russell, we are going to take a hard look at it. We're going to discuss step by step how it can be done here in Hawaii Nei. We'll be right back after this short break. Russell, you. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion. Nothing is making sense for me and you. We're going to give a little love, have a little hope, make this world a little better. Try a little more, hard and every more, let's do what we can. But grandmother, what big eyes you have, she said. What are you doing? <laughs> Research says reading from birth accelerates our baby's brain development. Push! Oh, Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day. Aloha, my name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. 3, 8. We're back. We're back. We're live with Russell Liu, uh, an American lawyer practicing in, in Beijing. and having a wonderful time examining the, what do you want to call it, the arbitrage of technology between China and Hawaii and the U.S. And so, um, you know, what makes it so successful in China that we get to learn from? Um, what, what are the things that the government has done to set up an environment where people can actually use these tech platforms in order to achieve instant and low capital bu uh, businesses? Well, I think the government is a very important driver because the government has been very flexible. They've allowed the internet giants, Baidu, uh, Alibaba, and uh, Tencent, called that, to actually grow, to develop the e-commerce platform. But along with it, has brought in a lot of money. It's one of the largest um, investment countries right now coming in, venture capital. The in American technology. venture capital. They come all over the world. They're investing in China mm. to these companies. Because they see the possibility. They see the potential. Yeah. So no matter what we do, it's a, it's a global thing. It's a cross-border. You know, and we've got to think here, how, where do we fit in the scheme of things, okay? And I think w what we have to do here, a selfish thing locally, although it's, it's a bigger effect on the U.S., is we have to look, how can we capitalize this? What do we need to do? Are we going to sit here... Uh, and continue uh, the same old economy. Our economy has been labor, well, a what labor what type I, what economy. From this, though, is that, you know, <clears throat> the way China works these days, you can, you know, you can criticize the whole communist business and all that. You can criticize their oh, aggressiveness in the South China Sea, their ambitions, uh, you know, geopolitical things. But the reality is, uh, in terms of the economy, they're very rational. They're creating a country where 1.4 or 1.5 billion people have a good life, or if, if not right now, today, then soon. And so, um, you know, we aren't going the same direction here. We have structures and bureaucracy. We have politics that, you know, is unpredictable. Um, we have all kinds of trouble going on in Washington and around 
um, you know, the government um, and the state governments for that matter. So we're not nearly in a place where we could establish the same kind of rational platform for using this technology to build those businesses. Uh, I mean, so that's not so easy. It's not so easy. And, and my question as before is, so how do we do it? Well, you know, let's take a look back at less. A few years back, when Governor Waihe was in office, um, my understanding was that Intel was looking at places where they're going to develop uh, their chip manufacturing industry. So they looked at Honolulu, they looked at Austin. And our economy is a, a different kind of economy, more labor, not knowledge-based. Okay, the Chinese are more of a knowledge-based. You see, you, you see what <laughs> I'm getting at? And they're way ahead of us. So when you have a labor-based economy, you don't have the capacity to do things. Also, it's too expensive. So, of course, they went to Austin, and we know the history of Austin after that. They've changed their economy has, has, has flourished because they have joined the, the technical age, the digital age. So we have a chance now. Why do we have a chance? Because yeah, I'll tell you why. Because the Chinese to up their game. The venture capital has to go out and collaborate with more outside, more joint ventures. The big America markets are there, number one. Uh, number two. Uh, some of the work in China that I've been doing in the past was, you know, the Chinese companies go out now and you do a joint venture research facility. So they learn technology, they learn certain skills. And so they do it with American company. Three, you need to build uh, a global capacity here. And how do you do that? Well, the big, it's opportunity because the big thing in the U.S. is why was it a FBI national priority to find the Chinese student who was missing at the University of Illinois? because one of the biggest industry things is education. A million Chinese students go abroad and travel, majority come to the U.S. college. They pay full fare. For law schools, they've been supporting the law schools it's where the decline has been them. going down. They, because they, they have the priorities right. And the government has a, a, a mandate to increase that so that they will learn uh, more about the West. They learn more about innovation, the Western style. So they do that. And so why not? The big, second largest employer in the state is University of Hawaii. Why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we working as one group, Clearinghouse, to get these Chinese students in the STEM courses, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics? So let me, let me, let me pull out the, mm, the assumption of my first uh, obstacle, my first challenge, that we have bureaucracy. And maybe the second one is that we don't have political will. We don't see this, and we don't you know, decide to move down the track. Let's assume that we do. Let's assume that we we are, are all of a sudden we find ourselves capable of reducing the bureaucracy and the cost of the bureaucracy and we find that um, we we can understand what they're doing in china and we can we want to do it here okay so that's a really wonderful playing field so my next question is so given all of that those two challenges aside what do we do to incorporate this kind of new technology in hawaii and in the u.s well, I think especially from a selfish point in Hawaii, we are a truly a cross-cultural place, but yeah. I don't think we really capitalize on yeah. it. The cultures that we talk about cross-culture are 100 years ago. We have a misconception, and we don't understand Asia. And uh, second thing is that we're looking at Asian economies that have passed. Japan has passed already. You, you got to follow the money. You're a lawyer, Jay, by training. We follow the money, and the money is the Chinese. Think about this. 40% of all venture capital investment in China was created by these three Chinese internet companies, as compared to only 5% of U.S. venture capital created by Amazon, Facebook, and Google. So there is room to grow. There's going to be money somewhere, okay? So you need and big capital we need to capital. develop this consumer right. technology. Right. And we don't have big capital here. Well, that's where everybody stops. And they say, we don't have big capital. How do we do it? Well, you know what? Get off your feet. Build the playing field. Uh, Kevin Coster that movie, build the field and they'll come. <laughs> what do you mean by build that field? What do you mean? It's easy. Number one, start getting the Chinese students here in the STEM courses because they're going to come here. Uh, after that, that student was, was uh, abducted and ki killed in Illinois, create a, a huge tech uh, core out of here. There's a lot of smart Chinese kids. Bring them here. They bring relations. They teach our kids how to be global, which is important, uh, very important. Number two, language capability. Instead of focusing on Japanese, let's focus on Mandarin. Look at the schools. Marino is doing an immersion program now in Mandarin. Yolani is going out there to get uh, Chinese students. Um, again, um, we need to follow that. Government needs to lead. 
It's a government of flexibility and leadership. You've got to think globally. Yeah. And you know what? I'll tell you something, Jay. The handwriting is on the wall. It's the broken ahana is what I call. Kids don't come back here. Grandkids don't come back here. Yeah. In the Chinese circle of life, the grandkids come back to take care of the parents. The, pa uh, the parents take care of their parents. Yeah. And the whole family lives in that harmonious environment. Family That's is what so talk important about. for social Family stability. is so important. So, Social economic let me, let me go to, back to the, the woman who uh, retired and would like to set up a business, or for that matter, the watermelon stand, okay? So I want to open up a watermelon juice stand right here on Bishop Street, okay? And I don't need a lot of space. I, I can do it, uh, you know, in a very small amount of space. <clears throat> so I rent the space, and I make the watermelon juice, and everybody loves my watermelon juice. But I want to make this really easy. I don't want to take credit cards. I don't want to take cash. I want to use the QR code technology. For example, you know, just one example of Chinese facilitating technology, consumer facilitation technology. How do I do that? Well, first, I suppose I have to get, I have to get the software. I have to have the unit there where I can read the fact that I have just been paid some money for the watermelon juice. And I have to get you, the customer, to download that app on your on your cell phone so you, you can pay me how much trouble would that be could that be done overnight is that easy or is that hard uh, can we take that from the Chinese can we use the Chinese software do we have to develop our own and who would do it you raised a trick question Jay here the answer lies in your question and what it is is what happens is that let's work with the Chinese to bring them here to do the joint ventures and to do the applied create a market here and and it's a big thing because this is how you get money in the local economy. This is how you get research. You bring them in here to a joint venture. Let's bring in uh, some other major U.S. Uh, internet giant and work with the University of Hawaii, and we create test markets. And it brings more Chinese tourists. They'll use their WeChat pay. And, it, and once you set that up in the system here, I mean, it takes a user about two or three minutes to download it. And once you download it, you put in your information in your bank. And uh, I, in China, I... I send a scan picture of my passport so they have it all there okay it doesn't take much but we need to, to go actively out there learn from the Chinese work with them because that platform also means that the Chinese are spending abroad they're gonna come and buy things in the US the biggest consumers sure so it's part of the universal it's, system it's a, it's a global system yeah more, more than anything yeah. and so what I'm saying to you is that this is an opportunity for you to to change the economy from a labor kind of economy to a knowledge economy yeah, yeah. and bring the kids back. It sounds like but such a simple thing, but it's, it, the implications are enormous. It means that, that my lady uh, retired can go and make a business all by herself with no capital investment. It means that I can open up my watermelon juice stand. It means that, that I and you can participate as customers. Uh, it means that there's more commerce, more flow of commerce. It's easier to do business, uh, easier to make, make revenue. Um, and, and really, we wouldn't have to do much at all. All we would have to do is, is have a Chinese partner. I don't think that's really essential, but learn from them, get that software, and then put it into play and, and sell it to the public so that they're willing to make the download and the businesses are willing to, you know, to do it, not much, in order to take the money from the people with the download. So, and if we mm -hmm. did this locally here in Hawaii, Nei, we would create uh, a community of this kind of QR facilitating software, and all of a sudden the world would see that it could be exported out of China, used elsewhere, and it is global. And we could prove that here, right here. And I'll give you a very easy way to do it, to test it. The, there's a Hawaii Retail Merchant Association. Work with the Hawaii Tourism Authority. And so if all the shops in Waikiki and all the tourist industry, ABC Drugs, are all of them, work with Alibaba, Alipay. And Alipay and WeChat Pay. So the Chinese tourists come here and work with Sea Trips, the biggest online tour uh, people uh, in China. Chinese tourists come here, they go to stores, wait, chat, pay. Money goes in, money comes out, sends it out back to the banks here. And there's got to be a way to figure that out. And you can test market that. And I'll bet you that sales will triple. I'll bet you're right, because it's so easy. It, you, you, you don't even have to take your wallet out. And it will increase the Chinese visitors coming here because they'll say, you have a platform, it's not in Chicago, it's not in York, New York. And again, these are all plus things. puts Hawaii on, on a puts global Hawaii map. on the global map. Brilliant, brilliant, Russell. So let's do it. Right after this show, let's, let's make a deal. Let's yeah. make a deal. Let's get that watermelon juice outside. Yeah.
Think, think Tech Asia, make a watermelon juice with QR codes. Thank you so much, Russell. Thank you, Jay. Russell Liu. Think Tech Asia. Thank <laughs> you.